everyone, and we want to welcome, welcome you to Talks at Google. My name is Denise Harada, and I'm super excited today to be moderating um, this talk with Fook Tran. Um, I'm with the Season of Us team and Health and Performance, and we are super excited to bring Fook out on Lunar New Year for our Lunar New Year event in partnership with AGN. So first, I want to tell you a little bit about his book. Um, he is... Um, He's here to discuss his memoir, Saigon, a, mem a Misfits memoir of great books, punk rock, and the fight to fit in. So, in 1975, during the fall of Saigon, Phuc Tran immigrated to America along with his family after a four-month harrowing journey that ended up in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, a small town where the Tran family struggled to assimilate into their new life. In this coming-of-age memoir, told through the themes of the books, of books such as The Metamorphosis, The Scarlet Letter, The Iliad, and more, Phuc Tran navigates the push and pull of finding and accepting himself despite the challenges of immigration, feelings of isolation, and teenage rebellion, all while attempting to meet the rigid expectations set by his immigrant parents. Phuc Tran has been a high school Latin teacher for more than 20 years, while also simultaneously establishing himself as a highly sought after tattooer in the Northeast. Tran graduated Bard College in 1995 with a BA in Classics and receives the Kalanan Classics Prize. He taught Latin, Greek, Sanskrit, and German. His 2012 TEDx talk, Grammar, Identity, and the Dark Side of the Subjunctive, was featured on NPR's TED Radio Hour. His acclaimed memoir, Saigon, a Misfits Memoir to Great Books, Punk Rock and the Fight to Fit In, received the 2020 New England Book Award for Nonfiction. And without further ado, we'd love to bring out Phuc Tran. Hey, thanks hey. for having me, Denise. Oh, That's I'm so happy you agreed to do this talk with us. Thank you so yeah. much. And um, funny quick story, um, I want to get into your book, but literally you're at the tattoo shop right now, right? I am, yeah, yeah. I literally you had a and you I had a client this morning. Tattooing like five minutes ago. No, no, like, <laughs> That's right. awesome. Yeah. Well, I am super happy that you even took the time to meet with us. And it was kind of short notice given I know that you're booked out as a tattooer. Um, so clearly, in my opinion, you're this Renaissance man. But um, <laughs> and you, you're so multifaceted. And that's why your book really fascinated me, me touched me, moved me. And I want everyone to read it. So for those that have not read your book, can you just give us the sort of Reader's Digest about your story? Sure. Um, you know, um, so my family um, fled Saigon, Vietnam in 1975 um, when the war ended. Uh, my grandparents worked for the U.S. Embassy, and so they were really, you know, our golden ticket out of um, Vietnam. And so my grandparents fled with... Um, you know, my parents and my aunts and uncles are about 12 of us, I think. Um, and um, we left Vietnam. I, I mean, I can, there's sort of like more to that story, you know, like I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna do the Seinfeld, like yada, yada, yada. <laughs> we uh, ended up in uh, Fort Indian Town Gap in Pennsylvania. And we were there until um, some uh, American sponsors sponsored our family. Um, and so we ended up going to Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Um, and that's where my family settled. Um, and so under the, you know, sort of mentorship of the, um, our sponsors, we sort of, you know, put down roots and stayed in Pennsylvania. Um, you know, and, and part of, part of living in Pennsylvania was that, um, there was a federal government policy called the refugee dispersion policy, which basically, was designed to keep Vietnamese refugees apart because they were worried about acculturation and assimilation. And, and their main worry was that if, if, if Vietnamese people sort of all gathered together, that would really slow how quickly they picked up the language and um, assimilate. And so the plan was like, oh, don't let these Vietnamese people settle together and because then that way, you know, they're, we're throwing them into the deep end. And, and so that's why we ended up in Pennsylvania as like, or in Carlisle as like the only refugee family. So, um, so yeah, you know, I, I, and of course now wow. I live in Orange County, California, you know, like they went to like the mothership <laughs> of the Vietnamese community, <laughs> but that's yeah. not where we grew up. 
No, exactly. I'm in, you know, San Jose, California, where I think we have the largest Vietnamese population outside of Vietnam. So this is just something that we, th this is just something all of us have been around, like all of this great food culture from all of the different cultures. Um, which is funny because when we were talking before, I said, if you had the same experience growing up, but in, in the Bay Area or in California in general, your experience would have been different. Yeah. But the same because you still have the same parents. Yeah, but I think, you know, I, I, I can imagine that, it, you know, I didn't have anybody to like compare notes with, right? Like, like, I didn't know what was sort of like traditional Vietnamese upbringing and then what was just like my parents' idiosyncrasies. You know, I think like other than my cousins and my brother, you know, like it, I, I think in retrospect, it would have been nice for me to like see other Vietnamese kids at school and be like, hey, are your parents doing this shit? Because this is super weird, you know, or, or whatever. <laughs> so, I mean, it, but, you know, it, um, yeah, I mean, I, it's hard to say, right? I mean, I think there's like this rabbit hole of like what would have been and there's just no way to know. I mean, um, exactly. but again, you know, yeah, growing up as, you know, like the only Asian kid, never mind Vietnamese kid in like my classes for, you know, 13 years, you know, that was, uh, that was super smooth. So <laughs> that's what I remember. I bet. It made you really resilient, right? Um, yeah. But the funny thing is, well, I, I just told a friend of mine, I said, you have to read the book. And, and we've talked about this, like, if it's sort of the litmus test of your readers, because how you start the book is, I, I think it was your intro, like, um, who's this dude? Because he was all of a sudden you have this new Vietnamese guy in high school, which I thought was kind of interesting. You're fighting to fit in, yeah. yet there's this other Vietnamese kid and you had already kind of carved your path in, in probably at that point you've chosen punk rock, right? Like that, yeah. that was your path. Yeah. Um, so interestingly enough, you're fighting to fit in, but you really struggled in some ways to stand out on your own. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, I mean, and, and it's, you know, you, in retrospect, you realize like, oh, that's just like the teenage experience. Like that is everybody's experience, like trying to find their place in the world. And, you know, I think like growing up as like the only Vietnamese kid in this like predominant, you know, 90% white town, like you just don't, it was, it was never clear to me growing up, like what was part of just like the regular teenage experience, what was part of the refugee experience, what was racism, you know, what was part of like, you know, what were the difficulties that were coming from, you know, living in an abusive household, so, yeah. Yeah, I really resonated with so much. And I'm and I I really had to stop in the book several times and, and stop and think. I mean, this is an amazing story. Like I wanted to step in your shoes. And also for everyone out there, I highly recommend the audio reading it as well as listening to it because Fook Tran is literally telling you his story. And it's so fitting because it's the memoir. So we hear your voice and we hear like the inflection. You tell a story in such a it's like a what so because there was abuse and that and you were combating things that were maybe culturally acceptable like even maybe even just in your family line but you didn't know any different until you see that not everyone else is getting hit with this metal rod so given that like clearly you've processed enough to be able to even tell the story and you and tell it in a what so manner without kind of getting caught up in the emotions which we still feel in your story have you heard from anyone else like in high school, like has anyone from your story read the book? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of my high school classmates read it. A lot of my high school teachers read it. Um, and, you know, and I think it's really powerful and interesting for me to hear from them just because I think I, you forget how much you go through high school and you're just sort of putting up this facade of like, everything's okay. Like, I like, you know, in, in a lot of ways, like high school was like a safe place for me. Like it was the place where like, you know, like I sort of like could navigate and and, and frankly, like my home life was so volatile and, and dysfunctional that, you know, um, that, you know, my English class or like my art class were the places where, you know, I, I felt like I had tangible success and I felt like people knew me and saw me and understood me. Um, you know, and I, and I, you know, I mean, I think it's just such an incredible, um, tribute to my teachers, my high school teachers. Um, but I think, you know, you you go through high school and I think, 
you, you know, your weaknesses are so easily weaponized in high school, you know, and you forget that, I think, or or it's easy to forget that as an adult, you know, but I think as a, as a high school teacher myself, like I see that all the time, like kids are just constantly sort of like hiding away um, their insecurities and, and the places in which they're vulnerable because it's so easily turned against you, right? Um, starting in middle school and then through high school. And um, yeah. No, that's great. So um, how many people have reached out? So your book came yeah. out um, actually right when the pandemic started. Interesting yeah. timing. Um, so I imagine your book tour has just been in jammies and, you know, um, yeah. you're yeah. sitting in your office. But have, have people reached out? Because like I said, I am not an immigrant, but I really resonated with so much of that story and sort of the unpacking of the upbringing so you can become a functional parent, a partner, um, an employee. I feel like that that sort of like, it was a rites of passage, but I don't want to pass that down to my daughter. I want her to learn maybe in a healthier way. Mm -hmm. um, have people reached out like from the community, like either Vietnamese community or for high school, like of how this has affected them? Yeah, you know, and I, I, in so many different ways, like, you know, the, the book I think is so interestingly, I mean, it's, it's like this Rorschach test, right, for what people bring to the table and and i think like that is is it's such a great reminder that you know you make this thing or you write this book you know and, and i think this goes for like the creative experience too like you make an album or you made a movie and, and you have no idea how people are going to receive it or what they're going to what else they're bringing to the table that's going to sort of refract that experience um but i think for me like it was so powerful to hear from other um vietnamese refugees who are my age who grew up because because of the refugee dispersion policy, they were like, oh my God, I was the only Vietnamese kid in, you know, Worcester, Massachusetts, or, you know, wherever, Arkansas or Louisiana. And I discovered skateboarding or punk rock. And it's just like, like, and, and there's so many of us, like, it's, I feel like there should be like this, like support group on Facebook or something, you know? And someone told me once that I didn't, re I didn't know this, but they were just like, yeah, it seems like there's this blueprint for like, sort of like rebellious, you know, like Asian or Vietnamese kids. And like, you either go punk or you go hip hop, you know, it's like, I didn't really have anybody who listened to hip hop. So I, you know, went punk, but you know, like, I was like, wow, that's a thing, I guess. So I don't know, maybe, maybe the readers and the people who are tuning in can tell me, but, um, but I've heard yeah. lots of like Vietnamese punks who were like, I discovered punk rock and it was like my saving grace. So it's it's pretty powerful. And it's so niche, right? Like you're just like, like what is the then overlap of like, you know, Vietnamese refugee kids who like discovered punk rock, but I guess a lot. We'll have to have someone do a study on that. Cause I'm wondering <laughs> if, if a lot of, uh, of a level of maybe marginalized cultures or people who are just struggling to fit in because in my high school, we had everyone. I Melpitas, California. We were the melting pot. Like everyone was there, and it was just something that was there. I mean, we had little pockets, but we were exposed to everything. So when I'm reading your story, I'm like, "Wow!" Like I'm mixed, and I even sometimes feel like I don't fit in. And you literally were plopped in where your dad, who is an attorney in Vietnam, is learning how to speak English while he's working at a tire factory. I mean, that's so powerful. And I'm sure that speaks to so many different immigrant situations. Yeah, and it's and and it's just a great reminder that like it's um it's a story that that it, for whatever reason is not it, it's not sticky in sort of like the American narrative, right? And so it's it's a good reminder, right? Like my story is not in some ways it's not unique, right? It's like it, it's but it's another version of this like immigrant story that I think we feel like needs to be you know um refreshed right like from time to time because i think it's really easy to forget and sort of like sweep it in under the rug and just be like oh yeah it was great you know they got to america happily ever after right because like oftentimes like that refugee narrative is like oh and it was such a struggle to get here and then they got there and it was over you know and yeah and for my family like for sure like that was their end goal but for me like you know, when we got here, like, that's when my story really started. Um, and so, you know, I, I just, and it's the only story that I can tell, right? It's my story. It's, um, I want to yeah. jump back because I actually feel like this is an important piece of sort of the, maybe synchronicity of, of like your whole story. When it starts, your whole family was on a bus. So mm. it was all 12 of you getting on the bus and then what happens? Oh yeah, sure. Um, 
Yeah, so you want to, we're going to spoil, <laughs> let's, sorry, it's like spoil I'm sorry, people, I, I want you guys to read this, but you, you no. have to read it, sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely, um, there's no spoiler alert. I mean, obviously, like, I'm alive, so that's like the big <laughs> spoiler, right? I, I live, but, um, you know, my, my whole family was in line to get on a transport bus, and that was going to take us to the airport, um, and, you know, we're, like, in line, in the line with, like, hundreds of other people, and then finally, like, we moved to the front of the line, and we got on the bus and when we got on the bus, like I was one and a half years old, two years old. And I started crying, like freaking out. And um, my grandmother was just like, like, like to such an extent that my grandmother was like mortified. And she's like, oh my God, like, okay, everybody get off the bus. Like Fook is like having a total shit fit. So we get off the bus. We let other people behind us get on the bus. Um, and then as the bus that we were supposed to be on pulls away, it gets hit by, you know, mortar fire blows up like right there everybody in the bus dies. And uh, yeah, so that was, I mean, that, you know, that like, that's, there's no rhyme or reason to that. Like, I feel like that's just sort of like the fortunes of war. Right. And, but yeah, so that was, and then we just got on the next bus, like another bus pulled up, we got on that one and we're like, okay, fingers crossed. And yeah, got to our transport. That's what I, it's just so powerful that this is real life. Like we're roughly the same age. This happened when you were like, you know, one and a half, two. And I think it's like a really good reminder as we, you know, sit in our cozy living rooms and, you know, worrying about what we're going to have for lunch. And, you know, I worry about like, are the cats okay? You know, that type of thing. And these things are happening, mm. you know, and it's, it's so important. So jumping to your parents, um, how did they feel? Because you really unpack a lot of the story. I mean, you're, you're really just telling it as what so, and there's a lot in there. And I, I just feel like, like, I'm so appreciative of how raw and honest and authentic you were just because I feel like you can, you're going to open this up. So, so many people are going to be able to identify with your story and you as a person and the immigrant story in general. So how did your parents feel? Because you, and your brother. We, we haven't mentioned your brother yet, but your brother's like tagging along on your journey, right? Right yeah. underneath you. Yeah. I mean, my, you know, um, you know, of all the people um, in my family that I was most nervous about, my bro I think my brother was the reader, you know, about whom I was most nervous just because, you know, we're, we're very close and, um, you know, and, and our, our experiences overlap so much, you know, like, I think I was worried that he was going to read it and just like kind of call bullshit on the whole thing, you know, and he's a lawyer. So I was like, Oh my God, he's going to sue me. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, he did not. Um, yeah. You know, he read an advanced copy and then he texted me and he was like, dude, you, you nailed it. Like you really captured both our experience in small town America, you know, in Carlisle and, and also like sort of the dis dysfunction of our family life. Um, you know, my parents didn't read it for a long time. They didn't read an advanced copy. And then um, uh, when they finally, like, I, I sort of like, you know, I, I didn't want to like say like, oh, you have to read it. But, you know, obviously if they want to read it, they can. Um, but eventually, I think like maybe like six months after the book was out, um, I texted them and I was like, uh, just asking, like, have you guys read the book? And, um, and then my dad texted me back. He's like, yes it was very painful. And like, that was kind of, that was it. Um, you know, I didn't want to press him on it. And, and I, you know, of course it, I can't imagine how painful it was for him to read. Um, and you know, I think my main concern is that, um, and I worry, I think that the, the nuances of how I present them is lost on my parents, you know, like I think for them, it, it, it probably just feels very black and white, you know, sort of that like Confucian household where, you know, kids are supposed to revere their parents. Um, and like, there's not like a conversation or, the, you know, there's there's definitely not any kind of feedback about about <laughs> the parenting, right? Like, it's sort of like my way or the highway. Um, and so I think like my parents are operating from that place or reading from that place. So I, I can imagine it's painful for them, but, um, but yeah. But I'm, I'm impressed. I mean, they, they obviously supported by reading it. Um, what about the rest of your cousins? Where is everyone now? Because there were 12 of you, there's like a little, and you guys were in, um, kind of neighboring apartment buildings, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, everyone kind of, you know, as part of the diaspora, right? I mean, like everyone um, left Carlisle eventually. Um, actually, my grand, um, I have like aunts and uncles and stuff who moved to San Jose. My my parents live in Orange County. Um, you know, I have cousins in like Michigan and Virginia and um, Texas and Florida. I mean, they're really like all over the place, France. Um, so yeah. Um, oh, and wow. 
Yeah, so I think I've heard, I, I haven't heard any sort of blowback. I, actually, only my grandmother. My grandmother like literally sent me an email and was just like, you got things wrong, like factually. She's like, and here are all the things you got wrong. And I'm like, thanks, thanks grandma. This is uh, my grandmother, grandmother in the book with the, you know, <laughs> she rules with an iron fist. She's a tough lady. She so. sounded tough. I was like, your description, I, I don't I don't want to blow the whole book, but your description of her eyebrows was killing me. And it was yeah. I can picture like I actually want you to make this into a movie because there's so many visuals of this this book. Like we're coming along this journey. There's like really heavy topics, and there's some stuff that I, I'm picturing her, but it's also very harsh too, because there's this matriarch of the family. And then I came to the realization you, you were in some part of the book you were talking about her, and I realized. Holy cow, she's like our age now. Yeah, yeah. Ruling and, like that. And I'm like, oh my God, is that how my family sees me? No, I'm kidding. Yeah. But like, yeah, yeah. wow, right? Yeah, and she had, and she actually had my aunt. Like, she got pregnant after my mother gave birth to me and my brother. So, like, she was, you know, like, I mean, it was like kind of a joke. Like, I think I describe her. This is so terrible. I say that in the book, I say she has a will and, an, and a uterus of iron. Yes. Because like you're just like cranking out kids, like even I mean, my aunt is like like I think almost like seven years younger than me, so it was unreal. Yeah. Anyway, but she and she was just a tough lady. Just you know, I mean, like you know, taking her shoe off and like you know, slapping my uncle with her like shoe. Like I was like, oh yeah, that's like the yeah. the yeah. iron the flop. <laughs> well, there was I mean, there's a story, and it was, I'm sure it's one of those pivotal things where. I think she's the one who disciplined you for stealing the the cards. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was not pleasant, you know. And kneeling kneeling on you know the uncooked rice in the corner, and what I thought was interesting, another gut punch was it wasn't your lesson. I'm I'm sure you're a lawful person, but it wasn't just I'm not going to steal. It was that we're yeah. It was it was that we're um we're poor. We're like too poor yeah. for yeah. these ninety nine cent cards, and that's. Yeah. That again resonating with a bunch of people here. You guys, you guys couldn't afford a lot of things. Your parents did budget everything. So in some ways, you didn't have that experience. Like, you know, the John Hughes movie we talk about. You know, the the white picket fence that we all you know fan, fantasized about, which wasn't real anyway. But you know, here it is out there for all of mm -hmm. us to pretend that you know we want our family's leg. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and I, I think it's uh, it's um. I think kids are way more aware of that than than we give them credit for. You know, like like you know, if they're aware of, you know, and and they're also resilient, right? Like, so so the kids, I think young kids, I, I see it in my daughters, like they're they're so quick to normalize things, right? Like the pandemic, like I think this the pandemic is like a great um, example, right? Like 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 it's just like habit. Like my, my daughters put on their masks, like they put on their coats and shoes, and. Um, but they're still aware of it, you know, so like I, I was really like acutely aware of, you know, how poor we were, you know, and that I was wearing like secondhand clothes, like through fifth or sixth grade, you know, like just, do you know, donation clothes. Um, but it was also normal. So like I didn't, like it wasn't like a source of like shame for me until like I got made fun of at school for it. And I was like, oh, like this isn't like a normal thing. Like, uh, okay, you know. I mean, you know, kids can be dicks, you know. <laughs> oh my oh my goodness. Well, that's why I think that's why I want everyone to read this. It's such because it's a coming of age and because there's so many common themes. That's why I was shocked. Like how can so many people resonate with with an immigrant because your story, I mean, it's it's unique in that here you are identifying as like one of the only Vietnamese kids in town and having to deal with that level of bullying, except there's, you know, kids in poverty or kids, you know, who don't have enough food. Um, I mean, this pandemic shining a light on a lot of domestic situations and everything. So um, I kind of feel like it, it just really reminded me that there are some of these pervasive themes. So like how, I think we all have a process once we become adults, like, so you can become a functioning partner so you can yeah. have kids like how were you able to handle everything process it um kind of overcome some of that yeah i mean i think you know i i you know i i can't um emphasize enough how powerful um counseling and therapy was for me you know i i, I wish i had discovered it earlier you know but i guess better late than never you know i think when i when my wife um, when we found out that my wife was pregnant, um, 
I, you know, I thought about like, it was like a, a huge moment for me. And I thought about, oh, like this is, this is when I become a father. Right. And, and then I thought about who I was as, as a son and it didn't give me like warm sort of like fuzzy feelings. And like, I think that was for me, like the little sort of like red, like warning light where I was like, Ooh, I think, I think I have stuff to like work out, you know, because like being a parent and being a child, I mean, they're, you know, two sides of the same coin. It's, it's a, it's a really, you know, you're, you're on either sort of charge of that, you know, sort of connection. And, um, and so I was like, okay. And I got, you know, found a therapist and started going to counseling to sort of like work through all this stuff, because I just thought there's just no way that I'm going to be the best parent that I can be if I've got all this trauma and like, you know, stuff that I need to process around being a, a, a son or a child. Um, so that was really powerful for me. Um, That's amazing. Was, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> so you no, know, I, mean, I, I so, yeah. really respect that you took that. I mean, we, we've talked about this before, but the, you know, I think there's such a, I have to power through this. Like, you know, I'm, I'm a survivor or, you know, whatever, whatever construct you want to create there. But I really feel like that's important also because if you don't know what normal is, like we weren't parents before. So like, if you're, if that was your role model, I really honor that you took those steps. So jumping to your book and telling your story, was that part of the kind of healing process or was this just like a story that you just wanted to tell and everyone's like you're funny dude put it on <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i mean i think you know yeah it's um I, I think for some people writing can be therapeutic and for me it definitely was not like i, I didn't have any ulterior motives personally in telling the story um you know i'd done all of my sort of therapy in therapy right um and um uh so so i was just telling the story um because i after i'd given the tedx talk i started doing sort of live storytelling here in in portland um you know sort of like these lives you know like get up on stage you have a mic and you tell like a true story from your life for like seven minutes and so like i was doing that just for you know sort of fun and um and so i kept getting feedback people were just like i, I really love the story and so in my brain i thought oh like you know someday when like i'm retired you know, and like my body doesn't work anymore. Like I'm going to write this story. Um, and then, and then I got the chance to write the book. Um, so it was in the back of my mind that I would, I would someday write some kind of memoir. But, um, I think when my agent solicited me, like it sort of accelerated like all those plans, um, a little bit, but, you know, but to go back to your question about the therapeutic aspect of it, actually, you know, in order to make the story feel more vivid and more raw, you know, I actually, um, sort of metaphorically had to sort of pick at some sort of emotional scabs just to make it a little more real. Um, but, but I mean, I, 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 so that was actually more challenging than say like processing. It was like to kind of go back and get into the mindset of like how I was at 14 or 15 or seven and, and try and sort of bring up the emotional reality of it. Um, that was hard. There were definitely some hard days like writing where I just like felt very drained or, you know, sad or, you know, whatever. Yeah. I bet. I feel guilty that we benefited from yeah. you opening up those wounds, but um, oh. it, is, it is such a yeah, no, <laughs> such a rich story. Um, so, your is your brother still in the area? Uh, he uh, he lives in um, Northern Virginia. Yeah. Oh, so so close enough. And, yeah. and does he have kids? And does he have like similar experiences? I mean, obviously he's he's probably not going to write about it, but yeah, no, and he's a different. I mean, obviously we're we're different people, very different people, I'd say. Um, you know, I always joke that like my brother's like the nice, he's the nice one, <laughs> you know, like people, like people meet me and they're like, oh, you're, you're like the evil twin. I'm like, uh, kind of, uh, <laughs> he's, my brother's so, he's such a nice guy. Um, no, he, so he's got two young kids. Um, they're actually the same age as my kids. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't want to say a whole lot more about his trajectory. Oh, no. I think we have, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's not my story to tell, but I think, you know, I, I definitely um, want to support him in his uh, journey as well. I'm not sure if he's in the same place that I am. Um, I, you know, he hasn't gone to therapy yet, <clears throat> but uh, working on him. Yeah. But, you know, even reading the book, in some ways I saw him like your little sidekick, like yeah. you were the one, you were really forging the path. And yeah. Um, there's one part in the story. I, I don't want to keep blowing the whole entire story for everyone, but there's, there's one part of the story where you had to step up at a very young age, even for a short amount of time and, you know, kind of do the cooking and the, um, it, I, 
I feel like at that moment, I think you even said it that you you literally had to flip like like I need to be like the adult here and like he's watching me. Mm. And I kind of saw that like through the high school journey. So it's I feel like you really forged a path and maybe in some ways made it a little bit easier on him because you had already kind of busted through. You yeah. already fought your way at the table, right? Yeah, for sure, for sure. And 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 I think what's, I mean, my brother and I had this like sort of big breakthrough um, I don't know, maybe like 10-ish years ago where like he and I had this like huge fight and about like something that I thought was just like nothing. Um, and it turned out that like, you know, like the the sort of emotional dynamic in our relationship is that he really does look at me like a father figure, you know? So when I say things like, oh, why did you do that? Like, I'm just thinking like, hey, we're like buds, right? Like you're my brother. Like, I'm just like, you know, like my criticism, you know, should be, it should feel more equitable, but you know, my brother really, or used to, maybe maybe he still does, I don't know. Look, he looks up to me in a sort of paternal way. And so that, that lands on him differently. And, and I had no idea, right? So of course, you know, like he gets really, was really offended. And I was like, dude, why are you like blowing this out of proportion? And then like, we had this sort of like breakthrough or like, oh, like yeah. I really am like a paternal figure. And, and I guess that dynamic is really common. I don't, I'm sure it's common for like many sort of sibling relationships, but it was, I've heard from other um, sort of like refugee and Vietnamese siblings who, who have that sort of like paternal or parental role that, you know, that, that falls on the older one. Um, that makes a lot of sense though. Um, I hadn't thought about that, but since your vision of your parents was a certain way based on, you know, your discipline and like, you know, how, how everything laid out, but if you were sort of in the paternal role for your brother, in some ways he was a little shielded. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, for sure. I mean, he had his own experience also, you know, that, and, um, and it was, I think it was not great when I went off to college and then he had to sort of, you know, navigate high school um, and, and I wasn't around. So really, he was really the only kid. But, you know, my parents are pretty laissez-faire in terms of, you know, like parenting. Like, I mean, my brother and I like never had high school, like curfews, you know, like we worked and we just kind of like, you know, I mean, it was definitely like my parents brought that from Vietnam, right? Like this kind of like, it takes a village to raise the kids. So like, you don't have to be like, oh, come home at midnight or whatever, because somebody else is looking out for them or whatever, yeah. <laughs> yeah, which meant a lot of trouble for you, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I prefer to call that like learning opportunities. <laughs> learning opportunities, I had many adventures. Yeah. Um, well, it was funny, I read one of your interviews, I won't mention where it was, but the guy kind of starts the conversation by saying, you are kind of jerky or jerkish or whatever, and I wouldn't let my daughter date you. And I kind of read that as immediately what I thought was that interviewer has not had anywhere near the experience that you had. Otherwise, he would have he would have picked up on that you were totally just like finding your way. Yeah, I think so. And I, th I just think we all have like really different kind of adolescent experiences, right? And um and I think like I, you know, w whether I fall into this kind of archetype of like the rebellious teenager or not, there are there are teenagers who who don't rebel and who have a oh. great relationship with their parents and all that stuff. And so I think, you know, I think I think that that particular person like, you know, has written like a memoir about his relationship with his mother and like how like it is, you know, and I don't I don't begrudge it. That's amazing. I, you know, I yeah. wish. I wish I had that relationship with my parents, you know, but you know, I, I have the relationship with them that I, I do have. Um, exactly. And, I, and like they, they did the best that they could with what right. they had. And then, right. then, you know, we strive to do better, right? <laughs> strive yeah, to totally, totally, totally. Yeah. Especially when you have kids that brings a whole different dynamic, you know, you're looking after these little ones who are looking at you and as, you know, silly as you are, or, you know, whatever they're picking up and they're marrying you. Do you find that your kids, are they at the age? Are, are they acting like you yet? Um, yeah, I mean, they're their own people for sure. I mean, and it's hard to know what what they get from me and what is, you know, it's, you know, it's like the, it's sort of like that false dichotomy of like nature or nurture, right? Like, and, you know, we realize like, it, you know, all the parenting books are like, it's kind of both, right? Like they, they have their own little personalities and they're also, um, you know, like constantly changing who they are and trying different things on, you know, so, um, you know, and I, I think I think one of the things that for me that was really important about the book was was to sort of honor and remember um, with as much um, sort of 
integrity as I could who I was as a kid. You know, I think it's so often that like as adults, especially like we don't take kids very seriously, right? Like, like when teenagers come to school and they're like, I have the wrong pair of jeans on my day is ruined. And it's, you know, and it's like, it's really hard not to roll your eyes, but like, it's their reality. Right. And like, it's, you know, and, and I can't think of like a, a greater disservice that we do to teenagers than to like constantly belittle them and not take them seriously and like blow off their concerns. Right. And then, and then all of a sudden in three years, we're like, okay, you're an adult now. Like now we're going to really treat you seriously. And it, it, it's not good training. I think during like the most formative years um, for all these adults around them to not take them seriously, parents, teachers, whoever. So I think, you know, I, I hope that, 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 that is an undercurrent about the sort of the, the earnestness with which I, I write about my experience. Cause I think it's, it's really important for, for us to treat kids seriously. Um, I agree. I agree. And now, so you taught high school and you taught languages for many years. And I know that there was a couple of key teachers that like probably saw your talents early on, you know, with writing. And I know um, you said one of them took, at least took you to plays, like really kind of um, saw that in you. And I, I feel like they helped elevate that in you, um, like give you a safe space to be, you know, the nerd, the, you know, the smart kid. So Fast forward to being a high school teacher. Can you see that in other kids? Like, did you take an active role in some of those like little underdogs? Yeah, I mean, d- definitely. You know, and I think I think I just, um, I, you know, I want to be available to kids. You know, and also to take um, to take the lead from them. You know, I think <clears throat> they're not always ready to talk. You know, but I think like if your door is open and you can listen to them and um you know take them seriously you know like i think the the most powerful thing for me with school was you know it was the it was the first place where i felt seen i felt valued and i felt understood um and it was so powerful um and i think like that that really goes to the heart of you know my ideas about what 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 is a community like right like what is a what you know what is the best place for me to be as a person right and it's like being in a space where you feel you know, seen, valued, and understood. And for me, that was high school. Um, yeah. Well, that that's great to hear, given that, like, high school experiences can be pretty rough anyway. And how your story starts, like, it was, I guess it could have been really bad, but I feel like you navigated it really well, yeah. speaking to, you know, the resilience. Yeah. Sure. And to the point, I think you had expressed to me before that you had the chance to come to California, where there were a bunch of people like you, and you guys, you were totally fine. I mean, I feel like at that point, you had already <laughs> paved your way perhaps? Yeah, I just, I was just so, yeah. So my junior year of high school, you know, my parents like were sort of hearing these like sort of faint rumblings about like all these Vietnamese people in Orange County and you know, or California, right? And they were like, hey, I think we want to move, you know, my parents like sat me and my brother down. They were like, we're going to move to California. And my brother and I like freaked out. We were just like, no way. Like, like you can move. Like, I'll just like poop on a couch or I don't know what, but like, you know, like you spend so much time like trying to sort of carve your place in high school. And I just couldn't imagine starting over as a senior. It just seemed nightmarish. So my brother and I like really like, we just like pleaded with my parents to not make us move um, and they didn't. So they actually let my brother finish um, high school and then and then they moved. <clears throat> oh, that, that actually, when you told me that, that actually made me feel better. Cause like, you know, if you're already struggling so much, my heart was saying, get out, get out, come yeah. to an area where, where there's people like you. Yeah. But I, I I think I was totally missing that you're, you had already, it's, it's your journey, number one. Um, and you had already experienced um, a way to make yourself stand out, also to fit in. Um, and it, I think that's an interesting theme in your book too. Like I said before, like how you open the book, which I don't want to blow it because people have to read it. But (laughs) I mean, that, that that first sentence was like, Oh, interesting. This is, this is going to be fun because he, he does want, there's a little bit of, I need to stand out, but I'm also Mm. fighting to fit in. So, and then like you said, like, I need to fight my way. I need to fight for my seat at the table, which you did. For sure. And I, and you know, and, in the title of the book, like I include that phrase, like the fight to fit in because it, it, it ends up being a fool's errand, right? Like, um, you know, shout out to Brene Brown, but you know, like she, she says that, you know, the, 
the opposite of fitting in is is belonging. Um, mm. That's really what we need, right? Because fitting in means that like it implies like what are the things that I need to change about myself or who I am in order to like fit this sort of predetermined mold, you know, that's been laid before me by like my community or my teachers, or my or my parents or you know my church or whatever, and and um, as as opposed to just you know being okay with yourself, right, and 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 recognizing that you are who you are and finding a community and a sense of belonging there. Um, so, so the idea of fitting in is, is sort of inherently in the title, but it's, you know, I mean, and it's part of like Americanizing, right? The idea of assimilation and all that stuff like that, that's about like, what are the, you know, as a refugee, it's like, okay, what are the things that you need to change about who you are in order to like fit into the community? I mean, I, I love that. That's, that is amazing because the word belonging means, means so much. And I feel like that, that does encompass everything that really probably you were seeking for. Um, we are at a great spot. They have some questions queued up for us. We have right, yeah, <laughs> some excited people. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. <laughs> awesome, by Justine. Um, will there be a sequel? I finished your book wanting to know how you got from high school self, your high school self to teaching and tattooing in Maine. Yes, <laughs> I love this question. Um, maybe, I, you know, I mean, there's definitely some ideas on the table. Um, you know, I, it's, um, uh, you, you know, I think like the thing that for me is, is that I have to wrap my brain around with, with, you know, like, do I write a memoir about the next part of my life is like, there's, you, you know, I think like there's like a natural tension for me in sort of trying to survive high school, right? And, and there are these situations that I have very little agency in, you know, like living in my parents' house and, you know, going to high school and living in this town. And like, I think once I get up to college, like I have, I feel like I have an incredible amount of agency and sort of sense of self and, or it's, it's growing. So, um, I mean, I still like get in, into all kinds of trouble, but it's all kind of like self-inflicted trouble. <laughs> so I'm not sure um, how compelling that is, you know, and then like the adulting stuff is just kind of like, you know, yeah, but I can, there's a little bit of it in the TEDx talk, um, but yeah, it's, nice. uh, but I can, yeah, I can, can I can, can tell you. you how can you tell Justine, she, everyone needs to hear this. So all of a sudden you're in college and then. Yeah. And then and you, oh, yeah. you left us hanging and now you're like this awesome tattooer. So how did that <laughs> even happen? You were teaching high school. Right, 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 right. So um, so I always wanted to get tattooed, but you know, I never had any money. Um, and then when I went off to college, my parents gave me this like emergency credit card. Um, and I discovered that it had this thing called cash advance, which I was like, what's that? And I was like, oh, free money. So I totally like in college, like went to the ATM, like took money out and started getting tattooed uh, and then and then kept getting tattooed through graduate school. Um, and then, yeah, so I went to grad school for for Latin to be a Latin teacher. And then um, and then my very last year of graduate school, the, the guy who was tattooing me, I was getting tattooed in New York City, um, but living in Massachusetts. So I would take the bus down and, and the guy was tattooing me. He's like, oh, we're looking for an apprentice. You should you should apply. And I was like, uh, OK. So I applied to be an apprentice, uh, tattoo apprentice, and and then I got a phone call like two weeks later, and they're like, "Well, right, just move to New York City, and we'll teach you how to tattoo." So it was unpaid, so I taught Latin during the day uh, to you know pay my bills and stuff, and then I would tattoo at night. Um, so yeah, that's that's like the very short version of it, you know. But that's still pretty amazing. You actually had two two passion jobs like at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, I mean, I, I think, you know, uh, no adventure starts with no, right? So like, I think I'm just game, like whatever comes across my lap. It's like, you want to write a book? Sure. You want to be a tattooer? All right, I'll give it a shot. Like, you know, I, I guess I'm not, I'm definitely not afraid to work a million hours um, a week. And, um, and I'll, I'll try pretty much anything once, maybe even twice if it doesn't kill me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's a determining factor. Yes. <laughs> All right, do we have any more questions? All right, from Vanna. Can you share the book writing experience? What was it like to dig into your childhood memories? Yeah, so I was, I mean, the book writing um, was, it was um, very lonely. Um, so I was, you know, I was teaching Latin during the day, I was tattooing at night. And so, um, so I had like an outline of the whole book already sort of planned. Like when we sold the book, <clears throat> it was, um, we had already like sort of deeply outlined it. So like every chapter was outlined and 
every sort of anecdote within each chapter was already spelled out. So it was never like I had to sit down. It, it wasn't like when I sat down, I was like, oh, what am I going to write about today? Like, it was always very clear what I had to sort of like where I had to go. Um, and so I just wrote, I wrote twice a month. So basically every other Sunday I would write for like, you know, eight to 10 hours. Like I would just go sit in a library and just like bang out, you know, like half a chapter. Um, so, you know, so it took me about a year, like, like 11 or 12 months to finish the manuscript. And then the editing process was another year. Um, yeah, so, so two years, like from, you know, sort of frame to finish as it were. Um, but I, I think I was really struck by how solitary it is. And, and you're, you're really kind of like on your own because, you know, unless you're getting a lot of feedback, um, you know, so like my wife would read like an early draft and then um, my agent and my editor would read it. And then that was it um, because I was really concerned about sort of having too many cooks in the kitchen um, and giving me sort of conflicting feedback. So, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. And I think you had already mentioned ripping off a couple of little scabs, you know, um, kind of digging into that too. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's that doesn't sound like fun, but we appreciate you. We appreciate thank that you. you. Thanks. thanks. <laughs> We're thank here you. for you too, Fook. <laughs> thanks, thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm here for you. <laughs> All right. We have another question from Theo. Wow, especially the part of just dusting off and going on to the next thing. Would love to hear if that um, if that energy of keep calm, carry on is something you've had to cultivate, or it's just inherent. Oh gosh, um, I I'm I'm pretty sure it was cultivated, and I think it was like this like survival mechanism. You know, like I think there was, I think like my my you'll read in the book, but I think like my my home life was volatile, like very volatile. And, um, and, uh, yeah, I think it was just like something that I, you know, I, I read somewhere, I don't know if this is true that like, you know, part of, part of trauma or one of the side effects of trauma is sort of this you know, ability to compartmentalize. Um, and, and I compartmentalize like really well, but I think it's a way to just make it through to the next day and, and try to find some good in the world, you know, especially as a kid, like, you're just like, okay, like that happened at home. Now I'm just going to go to school and I'm going to focus on school where things are normal. And um, so I think, yeah. That's great. And I'm so glad you were able to capture that as a teacher. I feel like that was a big pay it forward to maybe touch some, probably you probably touched so many lives teaching. And then now with a book by paying it forward with this, I don't want to say laissez faire, but like, you know, just like this happened and this, this is my other life and let's make the best of it. So I love that. Yeah. And I, and I think I, you know, and, and, thinking about the pandemic and thinking about the number of kids who can't be in school, you know, like, I think that is really um, heart wrenching for me because I, I know for me, like school was my safe place. Um, and I think about all the kids who are at home and maybe home is not like the greatest place for them, you know, and, um, and maybe their teachers are the ones who really are the ones who nurture them and see them for who they are. So I, 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 I know that like there's talk about kids going back to school next year and, you know, Fingers crossed. I hope it. Yeah. Is yeah, I agree. All right. We have a couple more questions for you. All right. Three chapters into your book. I'm deeply into your childhood memory. How do you think the isolated experience as the only Asian kid in school shaping um, shaping your relationship with family and the world? Ooh. <laughs> oh, man, that's so deep. Um, you know, like, I think if you look at it from a science experiment, right, like, so my, I have cousins who, like, moved to California and, like, grew up in, like, these, like, multi, multi-racial or super diverse areas. And I think, um, you know, I, I think for whatever reason, like, my, like, I, like, I'll, I'll sort of, like, think about my cousin and, like, she really seeks out um, sort of, like, other Asians or, like, the Vietnamese community because it's, like, a source of strength for her. Like, and she sees them as her people. And I'm not saying that I don't see Vietnamese people as my people, but because I grew up in isolation for so long, like I, I just, like, it's not even like a thing I look for because I just don't even know what I would get from it, if that makes any sense. Like, I think, um, like, I think I'm just, I, I think this is true for, for many people of color. Like you're, you're just so used to navigating like this like kind of white world, you know, like, and, and it's just what I'm used to. Um, you know, and that said, I think when I lived in New York, like I, I loved it, right? It's just like, I mean, New York where like you can get any kind of food and like experience like all these different languages and all these different people all the time. Like that was 
really um, incredible. Like it was such an incredible experience, you know. And right, like they're not they're not necessarily um, conflicting ideas, but like I'm also very comfortable living in the whitest state in America, you know. It's, it's like <laughs> here I am. Um, you know, but I also still like know where I can go and get like, you know, bun me and like the best pho in Portland for sure. This is important. These are important things, by the way. <laughs> today, today. Dumplings. Yeah, yeah, like, like this, and dumplings. <laughs> yes, this is this is incredibly important, like especially today. Um also I think we have one more question from Denny, um, thanks for sharing your story. I also appreciate how you broke down the word nyuk. I'm not even sure how to say that. In the book, I'm curious, um, since you're an author and artist, would you ever consider creating a graphic novel? Oh, gosh. Um, I uh, I thought about it, um, but I think um, I I think like I'm a very specific kind of artist, you know, like, like tattooing. So I think like, I, I think that's like a, a space in which like, I think there's so many other like people who are trained and like have, like, they're so good at the graphic sort of the graphic novel art world. Like I, I feel like the learning curve would be really steep for me. Um, and I, I honestly think I would have to like unlearn so much of what I have been doing for 24 years as a tattooer. Um, like it's really, you know, it, it's just like a very specific kind of look. It's almost like asking like a musician, like it's like, oh, you play jazz bass. Like, do you want to play in this heavy metal band too? You know, and it's just kind of like, oh, it's like very, it's a very different kind of bass style. But I appreciate that. Um, very I much. can't see where she's going with that because comic yeah. books and graphic novel, like I almost feel like there was such a part of maybe even you being excited about reading because you were mm -hmm. really, really into this. And I feel like that was maybe kind of part of your culture growing up. So I, I can see where she's going with that. For sure. No, I, you know, it, it's definitely like I, I, I've had people sort of bring it up, but I think, um, I think like for me, like the visual styles are so different um, that it would, it would just drive me crazy because, you know, everything would look like a tattoo. It would literally just be like 300 pages of like, this looks like a tattoo. This also looks like a tattoo. <laughs> I personally think that's awesome. That's great. Um, what, I'm just totally jumping subjects because you know, like I love your work. If if you guys have not done it, you have to check out his Instagram and his his tattoo shop. Um, it's Tsunami Tattoo in Portland, Maine. Correct. Thank yep. you. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm giving you a plug. You probably didn't want me to, but I'm telling everyone they have to go check it out. Um, <laughs> I'm I absolutely love Japanese work, and you just posted something recently that was amazing. Oh, but I've also seen you post some real silly things. Um, what, what is your favorite tattoo to do? Um, I, I know you're a professional, you're just doing the, these pieces of work, but you're also creating them. Hmm. Do you have any favorites? Gosh. Um, you know, I think I, I'm going to say, I'm going to cheat and say, I don't have a favorite. I think that my, uh, like what I love doing is I love, um, creating, um, work that is powerful for the, my client. Um, I think, um, you know, like I've done a couple of tattoos, especially like first timer tattoos and, you know, I, and I'm not saying this because I want people to cry, but like when people are so moved by their tattoo that like they're crying and it's mostly because of like what the tattoo represents or it's like, you know, an homage or a memorial piece to someone who's passed away. Like that's like, for, like to be able to be witness to and be part of the healing process is like so powerful. Um, and I, I don't ever sort of get tired of that. And it's, but I mean, that said, like you could also just get like a cool skull, like no one's going to cry about that. And that's also <laughs> awesome too. <laughs> That's really cool. I personally see I'm a big fan of tattooers. And I mean, I, I feel like it's such an art because you're putting something, you're putting on a piece of story or it could be a skull, you know, and whatever. But a lot of times that people are putting on these really meaningful pieces, like you said, that, that you know, that have all of this emotion kind of packed in there. Um, but you guys are like the sort of the bartenders and the therapists of that because you get to definitely facilitate that for them. For sure. Yeah. No, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I mean, we have a front row to like life experience, right? And it's, and it's very often at like the, the people, like people's like lowest moments and their highest moments, you know, it's like, I, you know, my daughter was just born. I want to, you know, sort of honor this or, you know, my father just died and I want to memorialize him or, you know, and then sort of everything in between too. It's, it's really amazing. Yeah. Um, That's great. And your wife is, she is managing your shop. 
Yep, yep. So she does all the back end stuff, and then um, yeah, and then she has she also works uh, for uh, Maine Public Radio and Television. Great. You guys are just like the Renaissance couple. I love you guys. <laughs> yes, yeah. No, we're just like totally negligent parents. Like our kids are at home just like eating dry ramen right now. So in their jammies still. I know. Like they forgot to get on Zoom today for school. I know. <laughs> You're like, I have, I have a meeting, you know, you're on your own. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. I I don't believe that at all. Um, someone asked, so we can get in a couple questions before we wrap yeah. up. Um, how long is your wait for tattoos? Um, about like nine months to a year. Yeah. Awesome. Did you, were you affected by the pandemic? I know out here in California, we shut down and all these places. I mean, their calendars must be so backed up. So how yeah. are you? Looking? Yeah, we, yeah, we were closed for four months um, during the initial pandemic from like March to July. Um, so I just was like unemployed, but you know, my kids were needed like homeschooling. So I was just like the homeschool, like the homeschool guy. So yeah, that was, that was interesting. Yeah. I don't think yeah. my, I don't think the teacher evaluations from my daughters are going to be very kind during that period. <laughs> they go, was, Our teacher's drinking a beer during the day. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not normal. What? <laughs> yeah, <don't> yeah. <laughs> oh, I thought that's what they did. Maybe that's what they want to do because everyone's like, it's intense right now. <laughs> Although I feel like we've been in this for so long, like it's a norm. And I, I mean, coming full circle to our talk, you know, obviously I was super excited about your book and I literally wanted everyone I know and everyone out at Google to read it. Thank you. But if it was normally talks at, it's, it's like so amazing. It's a phenomenal team, by the way, like the production and everyone putting all this together. But we would have been sitting on beanbags, like on a stage in New York. <laughs> we would just been chilling. You would have had to put take your jammies off and put on like real pants. And I mean, I would have too. Um, but now that it's virtual, I feel like you can reach a bigger audience. So where, where you were slighted by your book tour, you can probably reach more people maybe at one time. Yeah, maybe I, I'm, yeah, I have no idea. Right. But, um, I, I, you know, and I think like there's this kind of online half-life that's like, that has been going on and that's been great. And, and you're right. I mean, now it's like people can, you know, from all over, you know, and I can do like these like book tour, I mean, I can pop into like bookstores, you know, all, you know, all over the country, right. In any time zone. So I'm just, I'm so grateful and delighted that people are reading it and, you know, anybody's connecting to it at all, frankly. So it's, it's, um, it's just great. It's been great. Awesome. Well, um, in wrapping up, I want to thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're oh, super you. busy. No, and, no, you, Denise. Uh, happy new year. I mean, yeah. I really hope this uh, happy new year to everybody. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much again. And thanks also, I'm going to gush, but for really sharing your story, for willing to be raw and open and authentic because I think so many people are going to resonate with this. And I, I just really think that this should be shared widely. I am personally between us, just us, I'm pushing for a follow-up book memoir. Oh, I think yeah. All right. Do, it. do we know that? Do we know Yeah. That? So you can make a note of that. And um, <laughs> on that note, I want to thank everyone else for commenting and participating. Um, thanks season of us and AGN. Um, by the way, a lot of the people commenting, we really push this widely with our Asian Googler network and, they're so, um, they're really involved and fascinated with um, different cultures and really wanting to elevate the Asian community. So mm -hmm. I just want you to know that you were really sought after because of that. So yes, yeah, so um, kind of extending your story, we're sharing this with with a broader community here at Google. So we're super happy about that. Thanks. Anyway, well, thanks so much, Denise. Awesome. And have a great day, everyone at Google. Thank you for joining. And Fook and I wanted to say thank you also. You want a high five? Oh, yes. We did it. A little fist bump, too? Yeah. <laughs> Where's my fist bump? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and that's how it is. Thank you so much for joining, everyone, and have a great day. Thanks.